connecting. Is it recording? Um, it is recording, yes. And it'll right. stay on YouTube uh, for people to watch afterwards. So I'm just checking that we're there. Yeah, I can see us. Amazing. Um, so welcome back, everybody, to the National Creative Writing Industry Conference brought to you by Comma Press uh, in partnership with the Manchester Writing School. This is our fourth and final panel of the week, uh, writers' inspirations and how they use them. So I'm joined by four writers um, who have their, each have their own um, techniques and forms that they work in. And they're gonna be talking to you about where they find their inspirations for their work um, and how they utilize them, the techniques that they use to implement them to their writing. Uh, so I'm joined by Monique Ruffy, who is most recently the author of The Mermaid of Black Conch. Um, Luke Brown, who's most recently the author of Theft uh, and he's also written a novel called My Biggest Lie. Um, and Marina Benjamin, who's a non-fiction author, uh, who's most recently the author of Insomnia. And uh, she also wrote the book, The Middle Pause um, and other works. Uh, and the panel today is gonna to be chaired by Anjum Malik, senior lecturer of the Manchester Writing School. Uh, the, chair, the panel was supposed to be chaired by David Cooper, but he's um, sadly not, not been able to join us today because he's ill. Um, so yeah, we're, we're joined by Anjum. Um, thank you so much Anjum, Anjum for stepping in last minute. Um, as usual, I'm going to fade into the background now and hand over to Andrew to chair the conversation. But I will pop back up about quarter to 12 to field your questions. So any questions you have for any of the panellists, please do put them in the chat box. I can see all those and I'll be asking them uh, towards the end. So yeah, Andrew, I'm going to hand over to you now, please. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all. Um, as Zoe said, my name is Andrew Malik. I am a scriptwriter and a poet. Um, I do a lot of commissions, straightforward commissions, um, like for the BBC. Right now, I am writing my latest drama series, which is a cookbook, the first cookbook written by Madhu Jaffrey, which I'm turning into drama. Um, so my, one of my biggest writing passions is food. Um, and, but I also write um, uh, working with hard to reach, so-called hard to reach communities under the umbrella of my own company called The Hidden Stories. Um, and where I go and enable them to write their own work or I write it for them. And these are then produced as live art theater films using poetry and uh, script writing. So um, that's enough of me. Let's move over to our wonderful writers. We've got a great panel lined up for you. So can I welcome you all and uh, maybe ask you to introduce yourselves? Um, who would like to go first? How about you, Luke? Would you like to start off? Thank you. Um, Welcome. Everyone, it's nice to be here. Um, I am a novelist. Uh, I've written two novels. My debut is called My, oh, wrong one, my Biggest Lie. Um, my, my new novel uh, this year is called Theft. Um, I also teach at Manchester University in creative writing um, and work a couple of days a week as an editor for Serpent's Tale in London, a fiction editor. Um, yeah, that's, um, I'm from, from the northwest, I'm from Fleetwood, um, and I live in London, but spend a lot of time in Manchester teaching. Great, I know, I know Fleetwood because I just made a poetry film there uh, over, over lockdown. Oh, uh, so th yeah, that's the first time I went to Fleetwood. Um, thank you very much, Luke. Monique, would you like to come on next and introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I am a writer, uh, most uh, notably a, a novelist, and um, I've also written a memoir. I write a lot of literary journalism, essays. Um, I'm also a lecturer at the Manchester Writing School at MMU. Um, I teach on the uh, Reading Novels One, which I love. Um, I love teaching. So it's something that I feel is very much part of the at the centre of what I do as well. Giving back. I mentor um, writers from the Caribbean, which is where I'm born, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I am a co-founder of a small group of writers within Extinction Rebellion called Writers Rebel. And my work, I've written seven novels over about 20 years. I've been writing for ages. And I tend to be, I tend to constantly look at the same thing again and again. Um, women, um, the male gaze, mythology comes into my work. And I would say over time, looking back, I'm something of a magical realist in, in, in uh, my methodology. And uh, yeah, 
So that's me. Yeah, thank you, Monique. <clears throat> we are colleagues and we are a passion a lot, passionate lot teaching at MMU, aren't we? We love we love our teaching as well as we do, writing. yeah. It's thank it's you so much, much Monique. Part of what I do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we're we're a fabulous team. We love being there as well. And last but not least, Marina, would you like to come on and tell Hi, us about Andrew, yourself? Yeah. Um so like Monique, I've been writing for decades and um I've written five books and edited several others. Um, started off writing, um, I suppose, what you'd now call creative nonfiction um, and moved, have moved steadily more and more into memoir and also more and more, I would say, into more kind of lyrical style of writing. So maybe that's something I could talk about more later. Um, like the others, I, you know, I do other stuff too. I'm, I'm an editor on Eon magazine and um, I teach too. Um, I generally teach a life writing or creative nonfiction course at Arvin each year and um, I teach kind of creative writing techniques to PhD students as well. Um, so yeah, lots of different hats on, which I, I, I notice have in common with other um, panellists. I think that's in itself is interesting in terms of how you find your inspiration. I think that if you only wrote and you were only holed up in your study, what would you be writing about? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I think uh, um, it's very common for most working writers I know to wear several hats. And uh, for me as a writer, um, one of the reasons why I like going into the communities is because I think, you know, I like giving back and just moving away from myself and thinking about writing in a different way really so that's really really interesting before i forget i wanted to wish david um get well soon um it's, i'm sorry to hear david cooper was ill so i'm very happy to help out and step in so what we're going to do um is i've got some questions i'm going to ask everybody and so um i will do that and then uh, Sorry, I thought I switched my phone off. Um, and then it's a new phone, <laughs> it's annoying. Uh, and, uh, and then feel free to chip in guys. If I'm asking one of you a question and one of you, the other one wants to say something, please join in and add, you know, this, um, let's, I'm very happy if we can do that. Um, and then at the end we'll have, as Zoe said, we will have um, Q and A as well. So let me kick off by um, grabbing my questions. And I will start with, um, Mo, um, with Monique. Um, and actually, Luke, I'll ask you a question. Um, the first one is pretty straightforward, which we probably get asked a lot of times, which is where did the inspiration come from your latest novels? Um, if you can say a little bit about that. And of course, Marina, if you want to chip in us afterwards as well, please do, all of you. So who would like to start by answering how you came up with your inspiration for your latest novel? Um, I'm happy to go ahead. Go for it. Um, so um, I've just written a book about a mermaid, a made of black conch. I remember um, you, um, to interrupt you, I remember you doing that and the amazing energy you brought into the office throughout the process of that book. It was so inspiring. So I'm oh, thank looking you. forward to hearing all about it again. Um, basically, so um, a long time ago, like maybe seven or eight years ago, I was um, in Tobago in, northern, in the northern part for a fishing competition and I saw some very big fish get caught and weighed. And when they're weighed, they're hung by the tail. And um, I mean, it just, it just, I just couldn't get over it really. They look, they, it just, they would just look like they've been lynched and, and hung. And mm -hmm. then somebody cut the head off uh, one of these fish and stuck it on his head. And uh, in Trinidad, we, we have a, a, a tradition of what we call playing mass. And uh, he was playing mass, running oh, yeah. around with his look like a merman, except in reverse. And that was it. That was my. That was it. And after that, this mermaid just wow. lived in me, and I dreamt her and dreamt her, dreamt her and dreamt her and dreamt her until 
until in about 2016, I sat down and started writing about her. And then the rest, I just really, it was just a process. It popped out. It really popped out. Um, I found her voice. I mean, I found a way of making this work in terms of form, a montage form. And I, I have a strong memory. I wrote it really quickly. Um, and I know you want to talk about place and I'm happy to uh, talk about that later. But, yeah. um, but what happened was uh, normally my books are research heavy. This didn't take much research at all, really. And I did a draft and then I thought, mm, this is working out. And then I did a second draft. And normally I don't send it to my agent for, you know, three long time. And she said to me, you know, mm. what are you doing? You know, what are you working on? I said, oh, it's mermaid. Blah, blah, blah. She said, can I see it? And I said, well, it's not really ready. It's okay. You can see it. Yeah, sure. But you know, it's, it's a second draft. And, and she just nicked it off me and she said, it's ready. <laughs> so, you know, I would say, you know, I don't know about the other writers here, but it's, it's kind of synchronicitous. It's synchronicity, something happens that then perforates my unconscious, my dream world. And then I start to feel that mechanism start, the whirring, like some part of me starts to start working with this material. And also a mermaid is an ancient archetype. It's global archetype. We have been thinking up mermaids. So she's embedded. Yeah. And I wonder what the other writers have to say about, you know, how it all starts. Be fascinating. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's find out. Marina, would you like to go next and tell us how you get your inspiration? Um, um, especially for your last book, how did that come about? Um, so the last book um, is a very short book, Insomnia. Um, and that was, um, that was a book actually that came about through quite a kind of conscious process in a way, much more conscious than other things I've done, um, in the sense that I, was, I felt it was a book that I was throwing into um, a conversation with other books. So bunches of other books that I'd been reading that I thought, I'm going to have a conversation about this. Um, so it emerged that way. And I settled on a form very quickly as well, which held held the idea of, um, of writing about um, insomnia in a way that actually mimicked the insomniac experience. So a kind of jagged, self-interrupting, associative, fragmented form. And really once I had those two things in place, this was a book that also, like as Monique was saying, this was a book that came very quickly for me. Um, as I've been writing memoir, I think that the inspiration, quote unquote, inspiration's an odd word actually, because I think I think of it more like a seed that grows. So there's something, yes. there's some nub of something that either grows or, or, or irritates under the skin, yes. <laughs> so an, itch or a, an itch or an ache or a longing. For me, that's a very fruitful place to start. Like the and, grit, the grit that makes the, grit. the pearl, the grit in, yeah. in the oyster the that makes the pearl. Don't. Yeah. yeah yeah and um and, and I find then and then I start kind of I suppose two processes set off at the same time one is a process of reading a so conscious process and the other is the unconscious yeah. process and over time and the more I've written the more attuned the more accustomed I've become to kind of finding ways of listening and tapping into that unconscious process and then capturing yeah. whatever it is that's going on there because um, I think yeah, often this yeah. part of the writing comes from that process. Yeah, I think you're right that um, I know that when I first started writing, a lot of it came from things which made me angry or bugged me. And then in time you learn, I, it's not so, so much now because I write about food, which never annoys me. Mostly it doesn't annoy me, but, um, but you're right. I think after a while we begin to learn how to, how to, capture it all and put it into whatever form we want to put it into. That's wonderful. Thank you, Marina. And Luke, how about you for, with the um, same question? Yeah, so Where does your funny. inspiration come from? Because um, when my last novel took a few years to write, I started writing it in 2013 and I probably finished it at the end of 2018. Um, so it was about a five year process. I was doing lots of other jobs as well. So it wasn't continuous. Yeah work but it, it it grew out of resentment I suppose um I, I was I was trying I, yeah. I, was, I thought I would never manage to buy a place and I'd moved to London recently from Birmingham I had a sort of cushy life in London in a sort of cheap shared house and I was in London now and beginning to worry about how I was ever going to afford anywhere um 
so it began as a sort of idea of a property novel, um, a man living in this flat where he's looked out on a cheap, cheap rent and, and he's about to have that taken away from him. Um, it wasn't interesting enough on its own, that idea. Um, um, but I, the, the, I suppose the other thing that inspired me as well was the idea of the property novel in the past as well that you're writing and you're writing and you're always writing against the history of the novel in some sense as, as, a, as a reader and you're, you're trying to work out how I can use other novels to write my novel and so I was I was very interested in the 19th that could I write a 19th century property novel you know where, where with the powerless heroine awaiting um <laughs> awaiting the await for a love story that would that somehow determine the where property would feature feature deeply and so I had this idea that he would fall in love with a a woman his own age who was going out with a much older man. And so the, the various kind of in, the resentments came in. There was an intergenerational resentment, you know, yeah. that, 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 that I suppose I felt. And then buying into that, you know, being sort of uh, a northerner in London, there was a sort of class resentment that came through yeah. as well. And, 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 and Brexit happened in the middle of me writing this book as wow. well, which perfect so <laughs> many of the sort of oppositions that were going on within the novel and the misunderstandings. Um, so that changed the novel and, and, and sort of made me refigure it. It sort of happens. It's, it's very much background in the novel, but it came through. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I write really. I don't. I, I'm, I'm writing essentially for realism, I suppose, and that, that I'm the, the fiction that what what it, what inspires me is what's around me, um, and then and, and I write. I cleave quite close to my own life, but I need to form. A, an interesting form around that you know it's not autobiographical fiction but I'll, I'll often take a character who's a bit like me with lots of my background so the character is you know Fleetwood features heavily in this book it's a book you know I was going to call it North and South after another sort of classic 19th yeah. century um, uh, novel and I don't know why I chickened out a bit really but um, um, but yeah so so um, yeah I, I suppose I'm interested in the how you can use your life but slant it and change it and um, write about what's going on yeah. around you without being too didactic or, or you know, writing an issues novel. Um, I'm, I'm not so interested in that. And that's what I think both panelists are talking about, the unconsciousness. You, you think you're writing about an issue, but, but you'll surprise yourself by writing something um, where, where, that, where that's ostensibly what you started writing, but you'll, you'll go in a different direction. Um, yeah, course. yeah. And you touched on it, and maybe we can use that as a, um, uh, one of the questions. Is that um, that did you you know did you say that you looked at somebody another writer's process, um, yeah. or maybe we can talk about that. I can ask that as a question. Yeah, of how um, you might look at somebody else you admire, or the the way they work, or the model they use to write. Is that something you've used? Luke, well, I find uh, I, I find much. plot difficult. Plot seems to me one of the harder yeah. things to do to find a big structure for your novel and work out. So, so what I what I try to do is just steal the nineteenth century plot in some sense. You know, I, I use the trope of two orphans who inherit some some they inherit yes, a, that's it. Yeah. a deep, deep house in uh, the, the you know my character's mother dies at the start and he inherits a house in Fleetwood, which when he sold with his sister would barely get him a deposit for a place in London. So so that kind of sets up a sort of a pull yeah. back to the, to the north for him um, and um, that, that sets in train a series of events um, and you know I was, I was there's, there was a kind, there's a kind of a glib idea I had which is you know that he was a sort of 19th century heroine in some way he's powerless and wait you know the, the way he's yeah. going to get on is through, through a, a marriage you know an arra arrangement and then of course I thought well that, he's not like a 19th century heroine he's a he's a man for one thing you know and that, and that sets up <laughs> sort of a, a debate with you know yeah his relationships with women yes. and, different, and, and that sense you know a kind of engagement with um feminism i suppose or with his antagonisms with women um in the book um yeah yeah, yeah and uh, um yeah i think plot is like with script writing i think plot is really really uh, i'm sure it's the same with every other kind of writing but I do find that if I, sometimes if I'm stuck, I will watch how other scriptwriters have done their plot, depending on the story I'm writing, and then find a way to find my plot. And I might start by just maybe even copying the process, but then you find your own way out as well. So 
Do you, Marina, do you, how about you? Do you find that you take inspiration from how for structure or plot or any of your work from other writers you might admire or other works? Oh yeah, absolutely. Always stealing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very important. <laughs> Um, and, and actually trying as well to be conscious about that too, you know, trying to kind of credit where where my inspiration's coming Definitely. from. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think there's so much innovation as well in, in nonfiction now. I think structural okay. and, um, perspective and point of view innovation and formal innovation taking place in nonfiction. It's a very mm -hmm. exciting area, I think. Uh, there's a lot of boundary pushing going on so I'm always reading what other people are are doing and I think that relates to what I was saying earlier about being in conversation um with with the moment yeah. the cultural moment really what people how people other people are processing the world around them um mixing fiction with non-fiction and autobiography and um yeah and so yeah, on. it sounds yeah um and I read a lot of books about writing too. I really like reading memoirs about that's writing. That's true. Um, yeah. That's really, really important, isn't it? To read books on how to. And there are so many amazing books around that. Around that. So I'm the same. I, I read some of my favourites again and again. I don't know if you, any of you do that, but definitely read them again and again. And they really help you with the process mm -hmm. and to get your head around. And I think as time goes on, you 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 uh, read them differently, you know, as we move through our careers and through our experience. How about, sorry, were you going I to say just, something? I would add one more thing. I'm just thinking about, you know, the audience and how to say things that are kind of hopefully helpful to them, because I'm sure yeah. everyone who's trying to write or starting to write, you know, reads very widely. There's something about the two things I've mentioned. One is this idea that, you know, uh, you have to kind of nurture a new idea very, very carefully and delicately. And um, I would kind of advise against talking about it too much, really, because you can destroy a thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Never. Yes. I'm and very 100%. good point. Never, yeah. And, yeah and be really careful what you say. And when, yeah. Keep it in a very secret place and nurture mm. it along. And then also, the, you know, while you're reading widely and, and trying to learn craft or steal things from other people, actually most of all you have to trust your inner voice you have to trust yourself and you know much more than you think you do about your subject um and i think you know trusting learning to trust your own instincts and your unconscious process is a big part of it so um yeah yeah um thank you very much and uh, monique i'm sure i know you have something <laughs> to say about that question yeah uh, please share it with Ooh. us well i lo i really <laughs> echo everything that's been said and so I like what Marina said about, you know, when you have that nub of something happens, you know, you're kind of like, you know, I always yeah. think it's like getting that, that, that moment of inspiration. It's like you walk onto the lawn and you, you're, you know, you stand on a rake, the rake sort of hits you in the head. Um, and that <laughs> when, you know, or you get, you know, the javelin, you know, the, in, in Buddhism, we talk about the Vajra, <laughs> the lightning bolt, you know, hits you, you know, you're yes. like, ah, I know what, I, you know, and then it does need to be nurtured. I do an awful lot of conscious reading around what I think I think I'm doing and um, yeah. growing it quiet. However, I've been writing for 20 years now and literally probably about 20 years ago. I was much younger, my early 30s or something, and I went and did an Arvon course with um, a, a writer I had a big literary, a literary crush on. He was called, he's called Andrew Miller, actually. I mean, you must have heard of him, uh, not, um, author yeah. of books like Pure and Ingenious Pain. And, and I was really young and green and wanted to be a writer. And it was all, you know, ah, how do I make, you know, how do I make this happen? How do I make a long form? And he pointed me to an essay by Hilary Mantel um, called oh, Growing yeah. a Tail. And she talked about how she does a lot of research before she writes a word. So in a way she grows the story a long time before she writes anything. And I mean, I kind of, that just, that was just like, oh, okay. Yeah, I do, I can do that. I can do uh, that's, and so, she puts all her research into a ring binder and I'm going to turn my computer around in a, in a moment. I 
do it differently. I, I read and read and read and read and read. It's like ideas breed in a Petri dish and they mate with each other. And before you know it, you've got much more than you bargained on. You've got everything, you know, everything starts to grow. Um, I'm writing a crime novel at the moment. And I'm, and what I would say is, is I do a, an awful lot of thinking and growing, growing the novel. At some point I make some kind of basic plot plan usually very simple, beginning, middle, end. And then I start writing a draft. And then this process, I call it my garbage patch. You know, those ocean garbage patches, the one that, yes. that floats. So this is my garbage patch <laughs> up there, which oh. has been growing on my wall for quite a while. And every Is that novel, for one idea? Is that no, for that's your new every novel, crime novel? My crime novel. So oh, okay. every novel has a garbage patch or has a sort of a Petri dish amoeba thing. Okay. Because yeah. I respond so, to visual, if it's up there, it's better out than in. And it's in my yeah. head, my life. I walk past it every day. It's part, I gaze up at it. More stuff goes yeah. on. I clear space, more stuff goes on. More stuff. That's just how I work. And I've been working like this for years, years and years and years. Every novel has its Petri dish and I use visual stimulus yeah. and at some point. I draft and draft and cut and draft and read. Like as Marina says, I read, you know, yeah, books, books make up yeah. books make other books. Yes, yes. So definitely. Hilary Mantel I think it's a is a big who part I've, of writing, reading. Yeah. So I have this method and I stole it from Hilary Mantel and adapted it. And I teach <laughs> it a lot too. It works for me. It, it, everyone's got to find what works for them. Yes. And this is yes. how I work. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so um, how about place? Um, how do you think, do you, ha do you think when you're writing your work, say, let's look at the last, no no your latest work all for all of you. Um, um, how does place play into it? And is it something which is real? I think, I think, I know Luke has mentioned like Fleetwood, but, or do you make up places? How does that, play or not play into your uh, writing. Marina, would you like to kick off with that? I sort of think I should pass question. on this actually, and uh, or- only Oh, should you? <laughs> a yeah, so it's not something you work with place, do you think? Well, or? I mean, I'm interested in psychological place. Um, I think my okay. last books have been much more about kind of, you know, um, a mental place, um, although, I mean, I, there is a whole line going through insomnia about my history with beds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the bed, better the place, bed. it can be, yeah. <laughs> are the place. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, how about you, Monique, for place? Well, I come from um, a small island, Trinidad and Tobago, two islands. And um, so, where do I start? Um, it has a very, I mean, I know this place from childhood, from, you know, to now, and it has a very different palette of colors. Um, yes. Every time I come back from Trinidad and I'm on yeah. the Gatwick Express, I, re I feel as though the world has been turned down to pastel. Yes, yes. Because in yes. the Caribbean, everything is primary colours. Everything is bright red and everything is uh, screams at you colour-wise. And yes. uh, it's a post-colonial setting where there's this magical real juxtaposition of um, colonial architecture with jungle and improbable things are butting up against each other. The cities cities ringed by mountains, the mountains burst into flame. You know, it's just a magical place. I don't have to make things up. And V.S. Naipaul no. <laughs> talks a lot about stealing, you know, like what Trinidad represents. Yeah. It's like things just fall off the trees. So I'm very lucky and- It's a stunning place, yeah. It's, it's an incredible place. And my current novel, yeah. I'm very, very familiar with two different parts of Tobago and Northern Trinidad, which are very remote, very rural. And so, you know, with the black conch, it's an amalgam of these places and these people. And yeah. Um, yeah. And I also think that you can know 
also over a period of time, 55 years, I spent a lot of time living in Notting Hill Gate. I know that place quite well and people there yeah. may be. I live in East London. It's been taking me about eight years to really feel I know East London. Um, Trinidad, mm -hmm. I think all of us have got, we haven't all lived in one place all our lives. Yeah. So I think place for me is- Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's somewhere that for me, I also I think you even, I stare at things. I mean, I, I walk around staring at, I, I curtain twitch. I'm staring yeah. at people's windows staring at architecture, looking for old gods and goddesses everywhere. So it's a thing that I, yeah. I like to do. Great, thank you. And uh, Luke, for you is, I mean, you, you, you've, meant, you've touched on it already that, you know, you're from the North and, um, and you have experience of living in London. So play, how does place, it must, I think it plays a big part in your writing. Am I Certainly right? my last novel, yeah. I mean, like I said, I was, I was going to call it North, and it's a novel about yeah. um, regional antagonism, I guess. But I mean, my narrator also, also within London, place is very important in my novel, and that he lives in, in like a crumbling old flat above a Greg's in Dalston, um, in East <laughs> London, a sort of like a, a newly gentrified, um, historically, I suppose, quite poor black area of London in many ways um, yeah. and now it's you know it's changed drastically over like the last uh, 20 years and so he's being priced out so that's that's very important you know the, the place the place in mind is a way of looking at England's politics yeah. really um, um, and because he's from a sort of you know small town he hasn't got that the same platform to build a life in London for somebody who grew up in London um, and, and and you know has been able to and who inherits a house in London say or something like that um, and, but then yeah I mean I, I find yeah I, 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 I wrote a long read about Fleetwood as well for the Guardian quite recently which I should have done before I read the novel because it gave me, you know it gave me I, 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 I did a sort of journalist exploration into the town I'm from in a way well, well, on my novel, I relied purely on my memory and, and invention and what people might have done. But I, it's, it's amazing how you can discover more about the place you think you know by talking yeah, to people, yeah. I suppose. Um, and and yeah. there is, you can, you can research even the places you know and, um, and, and learn. Yeah, learn more well, about yeah. It. Yeah, um, and okay, so, so we have, um, we understand a little bit about where inspiration comes for you all. Um, uh, for Marina, with you, when you're writing nonfiction, how do you go about doing your research? Do you have a, does it vary with each project or do you have a way of carrying it out in a specific way? Have you developed a model talking about models? That's changed. The way I relate to the research has changed over time. I think when I started out, I I, um, I deferred to the research too much. You know, I, I I kind of did too much of it and I did it for too long before yeah. starting to write. <laughs> and now I think I do it the other way around. So I, I'm, I'm kind of reaching for research in all kinds of unlikely directions as I go along. And I, I do the two processes much more together the researching and the writing in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, and I also try and kind of split myself in other ways so that um, I try and do my formal kind of composed writing on the screen and then I have a notebook by my side. I just thought um, it might be helpful to talk about methods of working so that yeah, I kind of, kind of have a place to kind of splurge and extemporize. Um, or even nut out a problem on a notepad where there's no sense of kind of formal composition going on or hindering thinking. Um, but yeah, I think research is very important for me. I mean, yeah. um, because I think, um, sorry, this is to pick up on something Luke was saying, it struck me when he was talking about his novel, he said, I wanted to write about property, but I felt there wasn't enough there. Um, I think that's a really interesting kind of, I've shared that sentiment at times, feeling, you know, that a book can't just be about one thing, it has to be about a cluster of things. I once heard Deborah Levy talk not long ago, talking about every book having an ecology, a kind of a, a set of interdependent themes, each of which augments or plays off the other. Um, yeah. And... Um, 
And I think that reading kind of very kind of um, wantonly and voraciously and, um, you know, in a kind of not in a in a way where you're kind of trying to do honor by the research, but you're more kind of gobbling it up for inspiration because mm -hmm. you are aware that you're feeding a number of themes that are different uh, that interrelate and you're trying to work out what the interrelations are. And all the while you're trying to balance that idea of other people knowing more than you about a specific subject that you're looking into, but actually you needing to be the one who knows, because in order to write, you have to have that kind of authoritative uh, a feeling, not, not, not an authoritative kind of um, persona, but a feeling of, of authority, if you like. Yes. And that how, allows you to how do you... Fast and loose with the material. Yeah, and how do you know, Marina? <clears throat> I think you touched on it a little bit when you need to stop doing the research because sometimes we can pretend we are researching when we should be writing as writers, you know, because I find I will delay writing and I have to kind of pause, tie myself to the desk and yeah, then I get on with yeah. it. Once I start, it's okay. Yeah. How do you I, know I, when to I stop? Do you I... have anything to, any hints on that to help people? Yes, which is not to stop writing, even if it's just notes, even if it's just like little yeah. notes or things that you stick Very on the good. wall or, you know, in your notebook, is just to keep that process going alongside. So there's like a little motor or generator that's constantly running with the idea for the, for the, for the book that you're working on, yeah. so that you always yeah. have a place to pull back to and you don't get lost down the rabbit hole. Um, although I think it in yes, it's so happens, easy, you know, and, and you always find something down the rabbit hole anyway. So I don't think you can lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Uh, and uh, for you, Monique, how about that? Um, how do you yeah. how do you go about doing your research, and how do you stop um, the re how do you start writing from that research? To same question to you. Well. I mean, again, I, I just, yeah, what she said, you know, everything that Marina's just said, I completely, you know, yeah. feels very familiar territory. The best thing I ever heard from a experienced writer when I was much younger, starting yeah. out, was when you're stuck, do research. It's just, it's just uh, like, very good. it's like, if you ever get stuck, go to, go to the, go to the literature, go, go out there. But what I would say is, it's a, huh, not only do I have my wall and my reading and da, 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 I read a lot, but um, three of my Caribbean novels have been very field, field researchy. Yeah. And um, so for Archipelago, which was yeah. written in the aftermath of a devastating flood, my brother lost his home and his children wow. got washed away. It was really big. And I sat on it for a year. And then one day I said to my brother, if you could just pack it all in, you know, I, I, I got the most most unexpected reply from him which gave me the plot of my novel I said if you could ever just pack up and go because he's a sailor um I said where would you go and he said the Galapagos and I was like Ugh! I was like that's it <laughs> that is it that is the, that is the, that is my now you've because I wanted to write about the impact of climate change but it's a very preachy didactic subject so so in the process of researching a novel which was a journey from Trinidad and Tobago to the Galapagos I sailed halfway there on several different wow. boats and you have to go through these islands go through these archipelagos literally scribbling notes wherever I went taking thousands of photographs um, it was field research I um, mean finding I fell off a boat at one point and I hurt my leg very badly Ooh. got stitched up in the middle of nowhere um, so I, I mean, that was an epic, Amazing. it took months, it took months. And I flew to some of the islands. I eventually flew to the Galapagos and, you know, you name it, you know, I've been swimming with sharks and manta ray and ting, 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 all of those seals. Wow. But, but the, um, and then there was a book about a coup d'etat and I ended up um, interviewing, like really, like I wouldn't do this now, but I ended up interviewing people who had, were convicted criminals who had like perpetrated this coup d'etat was yeah. never got never got um, imprisoned. They're still kind of some of them are still alive, and you know loose in the community. It's particularly the leader. So I and, and you know breaking into buildings, archival research, oh. national archives, newspaper archives. Breaking into, into buildings. Well, yeah, kind of, yeah, <laughs> and um, and yes, 
And then things like uh, interviewing people, interviewing yeah. so many people, victims of a coup d'etat, people who've been shot, people who knew people who've been shot, da, 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 um, army generals, prime minister, journalists. I mean, so there's a lot of field research that's gone into a lot of my yeah. books, including the memoir. I ended up in a cave in um, France where Mary Magdalene is supposed to have died and levitated up to the, you know, so... I've seen Mary Magdalene's remains, apparently, you know, her skull. And so I've just been out there in the world, um, running Amazing. around, finding all the stuff that I needed to see for my own eyes, you know, like, oh, oh. You do have incredible energy, Monique. In the short time I've known you, it's like, amazing when you're working. I, it's really wonderful to watch. That's amazing, brilliant. Um, and Luke, do you have anything to add to that about and the same question. Um, I, I got so lost listening to Ronick's answer, I can't remember <laughs> what the question was to begin with. The question was um, that you've got you've got your inspiration, and uh, and how how do you go about getting started, and and how do you go about doing the research for a specific piece, but then how do you know when to stop? Because yeah. I, I believe, I tend to pretend that I'm researching, but really I'm just avoiding writing. Yeah. And, um, you know, how do you make yourself write? And uh, when you're stuck, what do you do to help yourself get moving? Yeah, I mean, re research doesn't work so well for my novels in an, in an obvious way in that, that I tend to write about the now and, um, and uh, the about characters with similar backgrounds to me or characters the same age as me. Um, so I suppose, the, you know, like I said in this one, the, a lot of the research was just trying to come up with a form and that's when I would read, that's when I'll read a lot of novels, I suppose. And yeah, the sense of being in dialogue with the novel as a, as a historical form that you're always looking or I'm always looking, well, what's this like? What, who am I writing like? You know, what, I, what who is, who is helpful to me here? Who can, how am I differing from, what's before you know if I'm writing this so I often write in this first person quite I have been I've changed my my new novel but uh, the first two novels were really an exercise in trying to perfect this um talky uh, digressive first person garrulous um manipulative narrator really you know both both my narrators of my, of my first are, are trying to control the the impression you receive of of he, him, um, and, and as, as the novel goes on, you begin to distrust him, you know, they're, they're both novels that work by a sort of um, an unreliable confession, you know, both of them, I suppose, yeah. are, are, are both phrase does. Um, and so you look, you know, and because I, I don't make a plot in advance, um, I, I find my plot as I write, really, I, I tend to start with an idea of... Wow. A situation and a conflict and something that concerns me but I don't know where that plot will go you know I like I, you know in this one I had a man tries to steal uh an older man's partner you know that was that was all I had and, that, and in, in that was was intergenerational relationship class resentment uh yeah, yeah. resentment all these things would, would, would come through in just that one idea but I didn't know how they'd play out chapter by chapter and what would what would keep the momentum going and which other characters would need to come in, you know, so I had invented a daughter for this uh, sort of elder, uh, older academic who, who, who my narrator is very jealous for. And then, you know, she, she became a sort of, sort of kind of young Marxist. And so you know, you've got lots, then you've had the sort of like the left from private privilege and the left from, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so for me, it's an organic form, really. I, I find the plot as it goes through and I'm very interested in plot and I like the, elegant contrivances sometimes of plot to 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 entertain but it, but I'm very keen that they there is not but it's like the balance between contrivance and and, and naturalness you know like of how to make yeah. contrivance seem as natural as possible um and I find that a hard thing to find or I did yeah. with, I did with my second novel my first novel sort of I, I fluked it really. I thought, you know, the, 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 everything I tried worked, and, uh, and it came yeah, out very good. Very quickly. good. Yeah, I, I, I think we're going to be running out of. We're yeah. going closer to the questions from our audiences, but I wondered if you wanted to quickly say one sentence. Uh, have we got time for this, Zoe? You're you're back on. I wondered if every one of you three, because it's been amazing listening to you all. Maybe a sentence of something, a piece of advice for the writers and writers-to-be who are listening to us. 
um, a quick sentence. Can we do that? Oh, that a difficult question to answer. Um, Marina, do you have anything to say about that? Um, yeah, just looking at the notes I made for this conversation. Um, I think I think um, when you're looking for inspiration and whether it fits in the work that you're doing or you're, you know, whether it's got legs on it, I think one thing I'd say is that everything everything you put in a book needs more than one reason to be there. Um, yeah, maybe two reasons or three reasons or more because you want the work to feel multivalent. Yes, great, thank you. Um, Monique? Well, I have this famous, anything? I have the saying now that's become quite well known for around me. People always quote it back to me and I still, I stand by it. It's not very, you know, I say you can't pull a novel out from up your own ass. You just can't. You need to do research. <laughs> you just cannot. You need love it. to do research. <laughs> it's not. Unless I love it's, that. <laughs> that's it. That's me. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Luke, anything to add to, uh, uh, <laughs> to that? I suppose what if you, the, I, I find the interesting parts of my life often when I'm thinking, oh, can I get away with this? Is, is this, is this, is this, this? Is this allowable in sort of against the mass feeling or the mass opinion of the times? And I think when you're, don't don't be shut down by sort of mass opinion, I suppose, you know, like try whether often the, often the most the most unpalatable parts, that's when you're writing well, I think, when you when you go, oh, I don't want anyone to see this. Maybe 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 people won't <laughs> like me if I write this. Maybe, maybe, um, yeah. maybe this this is embarrassing. I don't want my mum to read that. That's probably probably <laughs> when it's getting good. That's a bit too, yeah. Great. Um, Thank you. That's been amazing. Um, Zoe, do you have do you have questions? I think you're oh. muted. Oh yes, you're muted, Zoe. Hello, I'm back. Oh hi. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you'd frozen. <laughs> that guys, me just rambling on. You just watching. <laughs> um, no, there are loads of questions um, that the audience okay. is asking. Um, and Anjum, there's one specifically for you that's a bit of a tangent off what we've been talking about, but I think would be good to cover because, as I was saying to you earlier, we've not actually talked much about script writers at the conference this year. Um, okay. So Aidan is asking how amateur screenwriters can get their careers started. Um, he's written short scripts and is planning his first feature script. And he's wondering if you have any tips or advice for um, people starting out in that industry. Well, I mean, um, it, you know, uh, there is no short, quick way, I'm afraid. It's like uh, writing scripts and getting them produced. You know, we, um, it, it, but I would say keep writing if you produce the short script, make it, just get out there and make it. Mm -hmm. um, and even the features, you know, nowadays we have so many resources. Um, you know, if you think you can make it, just get out and make it, get a team together and make it and get it out there. A script mm -hmm. is always better out in the world, produced and something people can see rather than, even if you just do a trailer, you know, mm -hmm. and keep writing, um, keep looking up uh, the agents, the producers, the production companies who would be interested in your kind of work and keep contacting them and sending them your work and just keep going um, is, would be my tip. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea to make it into something physical so that you can see it and, Absolutely. See, it and see its flaws or, yeah, no, I think that's great advice. It's really important. Um, Callum is asking everybody, um, what are your biggest inhibitors to inspiration and creativity? So what do you guys find causes you to kind of come up against a block and not be able to work on something for a while. Marina, do you have anything to say? Uh, yeah, this one's easy. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, when I'm pulled in too many directions, when I can't, when I can't focus, when I'm taken out of my own center. So, and unfortunately that happens quite a bit. <laughs> I'm juggling too many things all the time, but so I need to really protect my writing space and my, um, thinking space when I'm working on a project and um, yeah until there is something I talk about in when I'm teaching I talk about uh, books jumping into life when you pass a sort of what I call a commitment <clears throat> threshold where they start owning you rather than the other way around and then and then you're fine yeah. you're home and dry because you it, you it can't won't leave you alone mm. yeah that's really interesting Monique did you have something to well, add? Well, I've written two 
sex books. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> one of them took 14 years to go from writing the early bits to publication. So I was 36 when I started it and I was 52 when I published it. So I would say shame. I would say shame um, oh, wow. was a big inhibitor. I had to sort of grow up and, and also I wrote the memoir. I wasn't ashamed of the memoir um, for some reason, but I wrote that much later in life in my late forties. But I had a sh there was a shame issue around sex and sexuality, which which I got through, you know, I got over it, I grew up and, but it took 14 years to write that book. Generally, these days, I think I sort of, I think I conquered the shame issue through writing really explicit sex, you know, wild, like, rah, off the scale sex. I now feel like I've baptized myself, you know, through fire. I've, it's like, it's hard for me to sort of, you know, I feel as though I've done something for myself by tackling, like um, Luke was saying about, you know, I really agree. I really hear what you say. If, if you feel uncomfortable, like, you know, the hairs, if you're making yourself uncomfortable, then you are definitely stepping on uh, the right, you're on the right track. Brilliant. Luke, do you have anything specific that stops you from creating? The time I was most blocked in my life was about a couple of years I'd sort of, when I started writing this novel. Um, when I just, I'd stopped working as a publisher and I had lots of time um, and the, I had too much time and I was, and I was interested and I was looking at social media and I was getting angry by the failure of my first novel to sell many copies and, and the success of, uh, the great success of writers who I considered frauds and I suddenly found myself obsessed with sort of the publishing scene and keeping tracks on it and, um, and it was deadly to me as a writer you know I had to move away from that and and um so yeah I don't know yeah I, I find I think social media is a big enemy of writing if you're if, if, if you if you become used to staying at home on your own and just checking it and being part of this larger thing I, so I had to, I had to just train myself not to partake in that world and not be interested in it and it, it worked so yeah did you speak yourself off social media completely or did you just kind of uh, I just took it off my phones I still occasionally look at it but I like I don't but my phone yeah my phone was distracting me I don't know I suppose you, everything was yeah. I, I, I couldn't concentrate I felt I felt in, in, in prod, you know it's the common common problem of the age isn't it but um, I think it's very important to devise strategies of not of, of um, consciously making yourself, protecting yourself from from the, the those those kind of harmful addictions that, that can, that, and and just and that and that kind of group think on on on, on social media is, is mm. it's, it, well it made me misanthropic too you know I'm like, I hated I hated everyone when I, when I, when I, when I looked at those opinions. Um, this can I just add something to this because this yeah. question came up on the panel I was on. For the Goldsmiths Prize, um, Erica Wagner asked us um, uh, how social media has changed our writing habits. And I would say completely, I wrote one of my novels pre-social media and it felt like such an innocent age. I felt like I was just allowed to be me. I had no idea where, where it would go, if it would be published. I had no idea about the competition, who else is out there. And I definitely feel, um, it inspires all kind. It's really, really inhibiting, and also it's just what the Buddhists call prapanka. It's noise. It's just noise all the time. You know, and it's just like bleating. People are bleating out there. You know, several different platforms. Having said that, I'm quite active. <laughs> <laughs> so difficult, and it's like, how do you weigh up the the distraction and the um, you know grief a lot of the time that it gives us and then obviously also being told on the other hand to be present and to build yourself online um and to stay you know mm. in touch with everything that's going on in the world because it's all there so why shouldn't you and that's going to help your work mm -hmm. I do feel like yeah I I I I just remembered listening to Luke and to Monique was that and all three of you really that when I first started it was pretty huge social media but even then, like I, I, I took, I got a laptop which had nothing on it except for my writing. So mm. when I went on it, I couldn't see emails coming in. Um, I and um, I would um, just be writing, and I would get up really early, and I still do that. I would get up at 
five, six o'clock and write. And if you've done two hours to four hours in the morning, it's still only 10 o'clock in the morning. And then you can be so smug. And then you can go on social media all day if you want, or just watch trash telly or go out, whatever. So it's quite nice in that way. And social media is really bad. I mean, you just have to switch it on and an hour's gone or half an hour's gone mm -hmm. and you're just checking mm -hmm. your Facebook. So I do recommend that you just switch it off or find, mm -hmm. uh, find something, you know, put your phone away, get a laptop, which has only got your writing on it, um, which seems hard thing to do, but it's really, really good thing really too. I no. think, uh, and like with Monique, where you, um, everything pulls you in different ways. It's really annoying. It, it, I totally get that because when you're doing several things and then I meticulously plan when I'm going to write and then it all goes out of the window because things are coming in. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. The writing didn't go quite the way you wanted it to. So you're writing in the afternoon when you should mm. be writing in the morning. And then it just takes over and it doesn't mm. matter what you have to do. Mm. You do what mm. you have to do and then you're still writing. So it's quite an mm. interesting process. Cool. Um, so I have a non-fiction specific question for you, Marina. Um, Karen was asking, um, how do you find another non-fiction hook to move on to after you've been so invested in the project that you've been working on? So I, I, so Karen is, I think, stuck after, finish, after completing something she, that she's been very emotionally invested in and has been working on for so long. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how, did you, how do you then pull yourself away from that and get into a new headspace for a new project? Um, I don't think that's a hard question actually for me to answer because I'm interested in lots of things at the same time and yet I need that personal connection always for me to get a book off the working board and into a kind of more a happening groove. Um, I also, I should say, although this is not very inspiring, it's the opposite of inspiring perhaps, I have so many files on my computer of books that I've started that have gone nowhere. <laughs> um, so I think maybe rather it's not so difficult to find ideas because they're all around us all the time, those little seeds. It's, it's how you make them grow, maybe. That's the more important thing. And, and I do think finding out or in probing or interrogating what your connection is or what your investment is or if you have skin in the game or if, you know, if there's a reason why you should be connected to this subject. So if, if it's something you're just very detached from, people I think make the mistake of thinking that with nonfiction writing, you need a detachment from your subject. I don't think you can write something very good if you're detached from it, or if you don't have an investment in it. Um, so um, I think, and at the same time, I also think it's impossible. It's a, a paradox, you know, you cannot work at having an idea because ideas don't arrive that way. So it's less about having an idea, I think, maybe than figuring out where the things in the world that you have a relational interest in. Mm, yeah. And then would maybe your advice be, because I've heard this a few times where people have kind of advised that you have you always have something else on the back burner, you know, to stop you getting so, as, especially when you start sending manuscripts out and stuff, people say it's, it's good to have something else or you know a lot of little things that you could go to and start investing in so that you're not so distracted in, in one thing is that something that you do not me mm -hmm. <laughs> i wish i could i'm very <laughs> much a kind of a monogamous writer you know mm -hmm. i have one idea that, at a time <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's, that's another way to do it and, and then i have lots of you know ideas that went nowhere mm -hmm. but there's usually one thing that's very live okay thank you for that um Sarah was asking, uh, for those who have mentored fiction writers, so I think that's at least three of you, um, how does it work with, how does it work with ideas? So what kind of things do you find you are mainly fixing or working on with other people's work when you're mentoring fiction? Um, what, kind, what kind of things crop up again and again, uh, common problem areas that you find you need to resolve with a new writer? Um, Luke, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... It's such a varied, uh, every, every writer is different. Um, common, I mean, when you work, I, I suppose the way I work, I mean, I work with writers as an editor, as a fiction editor and as a, as a, um, uh, a teacher and they're very similar, you know, you're, you're essentially looking at the page and, um, and, um, and asking the interesting questions that 
you know that the that the writing gives rise to that maybe aren't haven't been explored fully um um essentially i suppose the one thing that comes out is how is this going to beguile a reader you know that's that's the one thing you're always dealing with essentially with writing and, and how is this interesting to somebody beyond the, yourself i suppose and, and, and what by what tricks are you going to manipulate the reader into caring about this story what how what is how do you find the right form for what's what as you tell me is a really interesting a moving moving tale but what you know how do how do you how do you make the reader feel that and, and, and that's how do you order that um, so that amazing thank you did anyone else have anything to add um marina maybe maybe you've mentored in non-fiction i'm not sure Sorry, can, I was listening to Luke, so I missed the question. Mentor. No. Um, so uh, uh, someone was asking basically what are the what are the common problem areas that you find when you're working with um, someone else's work, when you're working with a new writer, when you're mentoring them or editing them? Mm. Um, common problems that they have. Um, I suppose sometimes it's maybe missing the bigger picture of the work that they're that they're doing and that as an editor, you can help them see the bigger picture and maybe the way that their work connects with other people because they may be at the coal face of something. So you can help them pull back and see how the different bits of the of the work kind of articulate together, um, mm. where the joints are. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think mentoring should be a, a kind of a conversation. I mean, I edit work all the time, like, like Luke does. I, I'm, on Eon, I'm editing long form writing all the time. Um, and I think that those are really helpful things to have in tandem, actually editing and writing. They're, they're very complementary um, skills. So um, with mentoring, I, I, I end up doing a lot of line editing as well because I can't help myself. So, uh, you know, so, but I think my job is to be a support and to kind of help the writer find their theme and how, to, how best to articulate it. Yeah, amazing. Monique and Anjum, did you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things I think when you're a new writer, and this was something I, I was told when I was becoming a new script writer, was to make the most of that time. Because once you become a working writer, um, you can have work, you know, you've got your commissions to work, you've got your deadlines. And it's a, it's a different way to be when you're a brand new writer and you're studying, like if you're doing an MA or something, that's what I was told, to just make the most of that wonderful time of where you're just doing your new work and to really make the most of it because it's a really nice time. And, and, and I think uh, every writer is different when, when I'm mentoring them. They're all different. They bring different things with them, different energies, different ideas. And it's working with them. It's always uh, helping them achieve what it is they want to achieve so I, I I think it's it's always exciting and uh, interesting to see and I think just like uh, Marina there is there is that remembering the bigger picture of um, um, but the, uh, and like Luke said every one of them is they vary so much you just it depends on who you're with and what they're writing mm -hmm. one thing I do think is that we talked about um, being inspired or stealing I think it's Copyright, you know, if you are going to use somebody else, that's one of the most important things to remember is that whilst we say be inspired and, um, you know, steal a way of working, it's really important. I think one of the things to remember is how to respect and acknowledge and uh, copyright of other writers, their work and what they've produced as well. Monique, did you have anything? Yeah, I, I, I have been teaching for a long time now and I've done lots of editing for the literary consultancy as well. What I would say to anybody who's starting out is give yourself a couple of years because learning to be an accomplished writer, it's like having a horse with like four reins, you know, that's a multidisciplinary thing that you need to get... Um, on board with in your own way so um everybody's got their own way so we all need to understand what we teach at the writing school which is craft 
So, I mean, you know, something basic like, you know, get all those adverbs out and, you know, look at language, L you know, look at, look at what, you know, literary prose consists of, what is it and look at it and um, plot, you know, that's, what are you writing about? There's so many things you need to get on board with that I think what I see again and again is people who are like, um, they want to get up and running really quickly, like and produce a novel in six months or a year or the first, they come to the writing school, they want to write their first novel in or at the writing school. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, we're looking at point of view here and we're looking at, you know, so I think give yourself a couple of years and um, craft, craft language, craft language um, in your own way, read a lot and, um, yeah, and even and also less is more. I keep seeing people who've um, incredibly ambitious novels hopping about in time. This all's going on. I'm like, try and my advice would be write one, write a book about one thing in third person, limited, omniscient narrator, and write it well and do something really straightforward. Because <laughs> so I'm always seeing these these young uh, novelists who are going, oh, you know. Uh, I'm like, how, I couldn't do that. I wouldn't even dream of doing this. You know, are you nuts? And they're really wedded to complex ideas. And I'm like, this can't work. It's a slow medium. It's a slow medium. A flashback in film would make it take a page to write. Do you want that? We're going to slow everything down with that page. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I think, and I know I'm rambling a bit, that we live in a visual era literature is a slow, it's a different language. And I'm constantly saying to students, flashbacks happen in films, not in books. They don't, they can't, it's a filmic term. You can't write a flashback. So I think, you know, it's like slow down. And I think, again, I see, you know, less is more. I see people with really ambitious plots who, and I think, you know, you've watched too many films that can't even, you can't do that in a book. Money, flashbacks are totally discouraged in script writing as well. There you go. <laughs> and the people go, oh, it's the flashback. I was like, no, something. I always say happening. get rid of them. <laughs> you don't flash back in the middle of a fight, you know, because it's just, your f the characters are fighting. So I, I think do not mix up movies with literature would be my biggie. Yeah. Um, less one. is more. Try to write something really simple with one point of view. Well, mm -hmm. maybe two. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm always trying to, no, come down, you know, off the wire, get people to, to sort of like, uh, yeah, I think, and I know we've run out of time, that our, our busy world of um, the visuals, uh, so many amazing writing happening out there um, uh, that we see, it's we're, we're, we're it's a different it's a different language uh this is a slow medium mm. do what we can do with with words mm. i think that's wonderful advice thank you all so much we have run out of time um but you've all been so brilliant thank you so much to Lou, Monique, marina and Anne john for chairing last minute <laughs> thank My you pleasure. so much <laughs> Um, it's been wonderful to have you um, and so concludes the conference but you can play back all of the free wow. events on Commerce YouTube channel um, thank you all for attending uh, yeah I'm going to say bye 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 everybody bye bye bye, bye. bye. bye.